Okay, testing, testing. Hey, let's thank Derek for being up there tonight on a Sunday night. Thanks, Derek. We appreciate all the sound guys, and, and uh, we're so glad you're here tonight. Uh, I'll start with a joke, then we'll have a prayer. This is, uh, and uh, Miles told a joke today in church, and he has made my job much easier <laughs> going forward. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, this is uh, a man and a woman had been married for over 60 years they shared everything they had talked about everything they kept no secrets from each other except that the little old woman had a shoe box in the top of her closet that she warned her husband never to open and never to ask her about for all those years he had never thought about the box but one day his wife got very sick and the doctor said she would not recover and trying to sort out their affairs, the little old man took down the shoebox and took it to the bedside of his wife. She agreed that it was time to talk about what was in the box. When he opened it, he found two crochet dolls and a stack of money totaling $100,000 cash. He asked her about the contents. She said, when we were to be married, my grandmother told me that the secret of a happy marriage was never to argue. She continued, my grandma told me that if I ever got angry with you, I should just quiet and crochet a doll. The old man was so moved he had to fight back the tears. Only two precious dolls were in the box. She'd only been angry with him two times in all those years of living and loving. He almost burst with happiness. Honey, he said, that explains the dolls, but what about all the money? Where did that come from? She said, oh, she said, that's the money I made from selling the other dolls. <laughs> so uh, there are tools uh, to get by with uh, in, in marriage. If I could have my wonderful wife come up and uh, thanks, honey. Let's pray. Father, thank you for um, the tools that you give us in your word that help us navigate marriage. And Lord, uh, if we could learn to apply everything that you teach us in your word, life would be grand. <laughs> and it doesn't come natural to us, um, and some of it is not easy for us. But, Lord, it is all right, and it is all true, because it's from you, and you made us, and you designed us. And you know that if we would follow um, the truths from your word, that our marriages would be strong and healthy and um, would be a testimony to the world of the difference you make in our lives. And so, God, that's why we're here. That's why Tom is teaching, so that we can learn how to have strong marriages, that we can learn how to um, get through the ups and the downs in marriages and just be a light to the world. So we just commit the evening to you, Father. Do what only you can do in our hearts and in our minds and in our spirits. And please use Tom as your instrument to teach these truths to us. Give us ears to hear so that we leave here knowing we've been taught by God. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, honey. Hey, I just wanted to do a little beginning here and then we'll get back into, but this deals with authority. And I never got to address this. I realized this as I was thinking about it. But people will say, well, what about uh, the heads of governments? What about an ungodly government? What about Hitler? How to explain if there's no authority anywhere? So listen, this is what Romans 13 says. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So I guess to start this, you have to look back to who was uh, governing authorities during Paul's day, and it was Nero. And Nero, and uh, yet Paul, James, Peter, wrote about being subject to the authorities. And that was in a, in a, in a time of uh, unquestionably, ungodly leadership in Rome. Now, they would not obey a command that would have uh, propositioned their faith. Uh, they would not have disobeyed a God command to obey a, a king command. But uh, those, those verses were written 
in those kind of, uh, under those kind of despot rules. So let's come forward. What about Hitler? Yeah. You know, the truth is that Hitler was elected chancellor in a democratic election. The truth is that the people of Germany had a very long-standing hatred against the Jews for a minimum of 10 years before Hitler was ever elected. When Hitler was elected, the people of Germany knew his position on the Jews, not to the point of extermination, but they knew his position, and they, they elected him. Now, here's the point. God coordinates the judgment of a nation with the judgment of its leaders. And you'll find that throughout the Old Testament. When you study the kings, when, ju when God brings judgment on a king he, or on a people, he brings a king that he's going to judge simultaneous to the people. And so I tell people one of the best ways to look at where, try to, to try to figure out where God's timeline of judgment on a nation is, is to look at the leaders because he coordinates the two. Now, if you question that, and, and you, you're certainly welcome to, you have to get around the scripture, first of all. But second, do a study in the book of First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, looking at the kings that God judges and how that coordinates with the people because he coordinates the two. Um, and so, uh, wherever there's authority, as we said, um, if we are told to, made to do something, you know, uh, uh, a, um, a one-child policy, two-child policy in China, which is now gone, but, uh, but you would, we would disobey. Uh, so those kinds of issues. So just to make that point, and, um, and again, you know, when it comes to getting under authority, um, well, let's keep going. There's, that's, there's a lot to talk about there. Hey, um, we're in week number four, and you have a handout. Uh, week number, let's look at week number three and review week number three if we can do that. If I can find week number three. There it is. Week number three, it's page 11 in your book. We'll fill in the blanks here. Just make sure you have this. Week three. God created man and woman one flesh. Very good. Woman is, um, I don't have that one. What, do we fill that in? Woman equals, what's that? I have the rest filled in. I don't have that. Completer. Yes. Woman is completer. Completer, easier is one, uh, completing what one cannot complete himself. It's probably a little shorter than that, but that's what it is. Woman is man's completer, and that means easer, and completes what man cannot complete himself. And number two, who is responsible for making the right decisions in your life? God, that's right. You're not, God is. It's your responsibility to figure out what God, uh, what his decision would be based on what the word of God says. And the principle of authority acts as an umbrella of protection and blessing to those who willingly submit. And the next line, the Bible says that a wife should follow her husband, which shows that the husband has, or submit to her husband, submit or follow, which has, or that he, got, he has a God-given need to lead. And we'll be looking at that issue tonight. And the Bible says that a man should love his wife which shows that the wife has a God-given need to be loved. Um, and we're going to look at next week in particular, the man's responsibility to love his wife and how he's to do that. And then 1 Peter 3, 1 to 5, we looked at the, the woman that is uh, precious in sight of God is the woman that is, is hidden, a hidden person of the heart, a hidden person of the heart. And then the rest we're going to get to tonight. So that's the opening, and let's just look at a couple issues. Last week, we looked at some stories of uh, husbands and wives. I talked about the tennis, biking, all of that, um, 
and those issues of competition and, um, and where that can get in the way of relationship. I thought I'd start, I have some letters that people have sent in from the time, time to time, and I thought I'd read these. This is Sue and I uh, did this marriage retreat up at a church in Brooklyn, New York, a number of years ago. And um, after we did, we got this letter uh, from one of the couples that were there. And she said, um, let me see here. Yeah. She said, thank God that we're now exploring our faith together more deeply. You guys, your retreat was a spark for that. The, your, the ideas were so simple, and you made the most intolerable notions seem acceptable, even necessary, to fulfill God's order. And then he goes on and writes this, her husband. He said, I just wanted to add my two cents. I'm still trying to find my place in what started out as Melissa's church. Now, so get the picture. She has a more developed faith, and he has come in and joined her church. So get that as a background. I just want to add my two cents. I'm still trying to find my place in what started out as Melissa's church. I was very casual about religion and spirituality up until the time Melissa and I were married. I began by following her lead out of respect for her, strong beliefs, and I became because I had become non-practicing for so long. Lately, I have been less comfortable in this role, and because of your lesson, I realized why. When you said that, you, that wives want their husbands to be their spiritual leader, it struck a chord with me, as well as Melissa. My playing second fiddle at church has been bothering Melissa, but it also bothers me. Your lesson made it clear to me that I need to work harder to make Melissa's church not only our church, but my church as well. Thank you for that. We'll let you know how it works out. You know, they're a really neat couple. Uh, this was a letter from a woman from our church. She said, I just want to send you a, a little thank you for your teaching on marriage. All this time I didn't realize how much I wasn't submissive until all at once on Sunday evening, which I have to admit was hard. I've been tested since then to open my mouth and give my opinion or to jump in and take over with the children, but God has held me back. On Sunday night after the class, I apologized. I'll make his name Bob. I apologized to Bob the minute I came through the door, and he said, I know because the Holy Spirit prepared me. That's why he told me to go to church to the class. Um, Bob already knew. I changed the name. Bob already knew out the outcome before I did. The way I ran things before in my marriage never worked, so I knew I had nothing to lose but instead to win. And um, this is um, from, uh, I'm not sure who this is from. It says, um, the insights you taught into a man's needs were so revealing that I think any man who was truly praying, paying attention felt relieved. These were things that bothered them, but they were unable to articulate the reasoning, the emotional impact these little things had on them. My husband realized that he was always bothered by an unexplainable feeling that he never attempted to share with me. He couldn't even explain it. But thank God you gave it a name and he instantly recognized that the strange feeling has something very logical, explainable, uh, completely understandable. I really struggle to understand him more than he struggles to understand me. And then the last one, this was a woman from uh, Springfield, Missouri, who we did the marriage series on radio, and they have a radio station, and they played this on the radio station out there. But this is what she said. She said, thank you. Uh, I've been set free from a major lifetime spiritual battle, battle through your marriage series. I know that the Holy Spirit used you to guide me to repentance and righteousness as I reflect on the year I'm grateful for epiphany moments that the Lord orchestrated for me, and I have to smile when I think he used uh, Calvary Chapel Republic's radio station. Um, she says, long story short, I had been praying to be willing to have God show me those things in my life that needed repentance so I could grow closer to God. Shortly after, I did ask God to expose my sins 
or any hindrances or barriers that obstructed my walk with him. Because of your marriage series, I've truly been set free from my sin of disobedience to God's design for biblical submission in my marriage, and for that matter, general life. My marriage has been transformed and better than a, the romance of first love. Which ends by saying, uh, thank you for loving God and serving him. Um, um, I'm, um, <laughs> enclosed is a copy of my husband's David study book, Absolutes or Nots. He's the wisest man I know. Wish I had followed his spiritual directive as it would have saved me nearly four decades of misery. Uh, truly, God is a God of second chances. Uh, sincerely. Yeah. So, you know, um, that's what I tell people when they say, should I come to marriage series? So you're probably going to hear things you haven't heard before and things that the world isn't going to really like that much, but it's Bible. It's Bible. And you can, you, you may not like it, but it's Bible. And it works. It makes a difference. It really, really does. So, uh, we pick up kind of in the middle of where we were. Um, and so this is just kind of a, a thought. Um, and this is just a general principle. You know, it really is pretty uh, dangerous to have expectations. Um, it, I have in my prayer list that I wouldn't have any expectations. Expectations get you in trouble. Because if you have high expectations, I, when I was in business, I would tell managers would come in and they'd say, boy, what a rotten day. I knew this was going to happen. And I said, you know, the problem is you came to work thinking you were going to have a perfect day. That's your problem. You set yourself up for failure because you're, you're just waiting for the problem to come and then you're going to complain. You ought to come to play. You ought to come to work that, you know, no expectations of a good day. You know, I'm going to have problems all day long. Maybe have expectations on that, on that bottom side of it. You know, I'm... Um, but expect, I, I expected you'd do this. I expected you'd make the bed. I expected you'd do the dishes. I'd expected you took the trash out. I'd expect you, I expected you. And you're setting yourself up and you're setting your partner up for failure. It's better not, and, and it really is better not to have expectations. You know, the, this is a little, sprinkle some of these tools in, but my wife and I have done this for a lot of years. You know, um, I think a lot of men are the same way. Uh, you know, when I come home from work, I'm home from work. And, and if Sue would say to me, hey, this is, this is broke, this is broke, this needs to be fixed, that needs to be fixed, it's kind of like, like, I feel like a machine gun hitting me. I, I have to work all day long. I come home, I walk in the door and say, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, man. So we worked this little thing out. This might work for you where she would, she would write down a piece of paper things that needed to be fixed, things that needed to be done. And she'd put that piece of paper there. And then I'd look at the piece of paper. Men, that, number one, you have to look at the piece of paper. And I'd had time to process it. Because like she'd say, the, the faucet needs to be fixed. Well, okay, I look at the piece of paper and I realize it's a Delta faucet. Lowe's has the, the seal kits. I know where they are, I know what I need, you know, and I can start thinking, I've got the tool, I can fix that, what can I do? But you start processing that in your own time in a way that takes all the pressure off of that. And that has worked for us. It might not work for you, but it does work for us. Um, and that expectations. It's like the stories told of a, of a woman who complained to a counselor that her husband always came home late from dinner, and she said she was sick of it. And... Uh, uh, he said, well, the problem is uh, you have expectations. Uh, you expect your husband to come home at a certain time. And uh, that's getting you in trouble. So she said, okay. So she decides she's not going to have expectations. True story. So her, she, her husband came home late, and she had dinner in the stove, and uh, the food was hot, and she was cool. And, and he said, whoa, you know, what's, what's going on? She said, well... I didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't really expect you to come home. There are a lot of women where their husbands didn't come home. You came home. I'm happy you're home. And, uh, and guess what? He started coming home earlier because of that kind of an attitude. So uh, expectations. And then another thing, and this goes on both sides. 
is, you know, to really believe in your partner, really believe in them. Even if they've had failures in the past, believe in them. Do you know how much Jesus believes in you? Do you know how much? And you know that there shouldn't be, I would be crushed if I found out that there's another man that believes in my wife more than I believe in her. That should not be, right? There should be nobody that believes in that woman as much as I believe in that woman. There should be nobody that believes in me as much as my wife. And so believe in them. You know, let me give an example about how radical this is with Jesus. There was a man, and he's dead now, so I can say, say his name, but his name was Ray. And Ray was probably, he would probably be 60 years old right now. And that time he would have been 45. And he was a colorful guy, but he had an addiction issue. He'd go into his addiction, come out, and when he'd come out, he'd get rock solid with the Lord and just take off. He'd go into his addiction, come out, go back with the Lord, go rock solid back into his faith. He probably did that. I'm not exaggerating. I don't think I'm. Probably nine times in his lifetime I saw that happen. And here's my point. Every time he did, he got serious about his faith and went back in his faith. The Lord just went right with him. You know what I mean? The Lord would go as far and as fast as Ray would go. But here's my point. Think about it. All eight times after, God knew he was going to do it again. In foreknowledge, he knew he was going to do it again, and yet he was still all in. Did you get the point? That's what God does with us. How should we be with our partners? You know, we should be all in. And um, so, you know, believe in me. I probably said this before. One of the nicest statements I ever heard is, I like myself the best when I'm with you. I like myself the best when I'm with you. Well, why is that? Because you believe in me, because you love me, because you have confidence in me. We should be able to say that. Um, you know, there was um, a man that I met with one time, and uh, I don't think I shared this story, but he, uh, he wouldn't, uh, his wife said, my husband won't do anything around the house. And uh, that, let's keep going, forget that. Well, you all do your stuff around the house, okay? And then just another little thing. Uh, don't criticize your partner in public. Uh, don't criticize, talk down about your, your, your wife, your husband at work because uh, you set yourself up uh, for a guy trying to hit on you or a woman trying to hit on you because if you complain about your partner, they see a crack. They see a crack in the marriage. And there are some people that will try to break that crack wider. And um, yeah, D don't, don't do that. And also, on both sides, you know, don't criticize each other in public. You know, don't correct each other in public. That's, that's, that's something that's easy. It really is easy to do. You just have to think about it when it happens. So it's like, you know, you're in public and they say, you're, you're, you're with another couple, and you say, on Tuesday, you're with, your, you're with your husband, you're with your wife. You said, on Tuesday, we went to uh, Outback. And she says, no, it was Monday. No, it was Tuesday. No, it was Monday. You remember, we, we took the kids to the baseball game. There. Oh, yeah, because Monday. And I had a sirloin steak. No, you had a filet mignon. No, I had a sirloin. Don't you remember? No, it was just, I'm t it was just like, and you watch this go back and forth, and you think, don't they hear what, they're, what this sounds like? You know what I mean? Just, just let that go. Um, don't criticize in public. There's an article. Let me find this. Um, oh, you know what? This is page 16 in your book. That's how we can find it. And I was supposed to tell you that we're missing. Page 14 is missing in some of your books. The back, the back half Yeah, we w we'll try to get a copy of that. I have the note. Yeah. Yeah. So, page 16. Yeah, this is interesting. Um, it's uh, IQ bruised as ego battered. 
If someone makes you feel stupid, that doesn't make you stupid, does it? Well, actually it might, according to a two-year study in isolation and rejection considered by, uh, conducted by social psychologist Roy Baumeister. Subjects were given a variety of intelligence tests. Listen, they were given a variety of intelligence tests and then made to feel rejected. Some were given a personality evaluation that led them to believe falsely that they were destined to spend their lives alone. Others were allowed to mingle with a group of strangers with whom they were told they might be called upon soon to complete a task. But later, they were told that none of the strangers wished to have anything to do with them. After these unpleasant experiences of being rejected, the subjects were tested again for intelligence. Their IQ scores plummeted by 25% and their analytical reasoning by 30%. Baumeister says the results are the most dramatic he's seen in a quarter century of research on self-esteem, rejection, and aggression. He says, quote, connecting with others is one of the deepest and most powerful human drives, and thwarting it has a big impact. After being rejected, people cannot think straight for a while. Fortunately, the effects of a single rejection appear to be short-lived. But how intelligence is affected by repeated rejections is an open question worthy of further study. So just how much it means. You know, as you, you talk to children, you know, if, you, if a child feels that the parents say, you're dumb and stupid, you'll never be anything, how that affects? I mean, if, 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 if a one-off in, in a survey like this affects 25 to 30%, what, what does a lifetime of a child hearing that affect? What, is, what difference does it make when, you're, when your marriage partner believes in you? and your ability to accomplish those things that they think you can do, you know? Uh, my wife has believed in me to do a lot of things that I didn't think I could do. And uh, I've pushed her off a lot of cliffs and things through the years that she didn't think she could do. And um, so, um, so how, how do we apply this every day? Um, we're gonna read a couple articles coming up that deal with this issue. Um, so let's, again, let's go look at Ephesians 5, and we're going to read some clips. The second half of this evening, we're going to split up the men and the women, and we're going to look at two questions, and uh, the women are going to answer them, the men are going to answer them, and then next week, we'll come back together and discuss uh, what the other group came up with and talk that through. That's always fun. But we want to look at a couple more uh, uh, issues on this issue tonight. Ephesians 5, 22. We're going to read this every week because, again, this is the, uh, the key. Ephesians 5, 22. It says, You wives, submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of his body, the church. He gave his life to be her savior. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives must submit to your husbands in everything. And you husbands must love your wives with the same love Christ showed the church, gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by baptism in God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church, without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For man is actually loving himself when he loves his wife. No one hates his own body, but lovingly cares for it. Can I just mention something there, parenthetically? It says no one ever, no one hates his own body, but lovingly cares for it. And I thought about that as I read. We had a, a woman live with us for a period of time years ago, and she dealt with anorexia, severe. And... You know, I thought, and someone that with an eating disorder, they don't love their body. They don't care for their body. But the Bible says that no one hates his own body, but lovingly cares for it. And I thought, how do you square those two, the scripture and that reality? And you know, I think the way you do it is, is the natural man does not hate his own body. An animal does not hate its body. Animals don't cut their bodies. They don't purge after they eat. You know, that's, that's outside of the realm of what, of, of, of what an animal does. 
It, and so my point is, it's, it's not biological, it's spiritual, it's demonic. So no one, no one in, their, in their natural body hates their body. No one in their natural body doesn't take care of their body. And when they don't, it's outside of the natural, which means it's spiritual. And if it's spiritual, it's certainly not from God. And that only leaves one source. So this is true and just makes the case that an eating disorder is not uh, natural. It's not out of the natural. Anyway, no one hates his own body, but lovingly cares for it, just as Christ cares for the body, which is the church. And we are his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. Again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So I apologize for these, these old examples, but uh, we've been teaching this a long time, and I haven't come up with new examples because I don't, we don't really watch TV. We watch movies sometimes, but I've, we don't watch. So I don't know what TV shows are out today. I knew these shows. Anybody, just raise your hand if you know who this is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Ozzy and Harriet. So there are four types of marriage, and this is in your handout. The first are love and submit. Love and submit. He loved his wife, and she submitted. Look at that family. Can't you tell that? They were just the perfect family. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Kurt Cobain, how many know the name Kurt Cobain? Oh, wow, good. You know, he committed suicide, right? His favorite TV show was, was um, um, Mayberry RFD, one of those things that Andy Griffith was in. That was his favorite show because it was a world he always wanted to live in. It was a dream world that he never, he never experienced. But that's this world. Kurt Cobain, that's this world. The dream, love and submit. He loved his wife, and she submitted. The next one was Archie Bunker. I can do that. And there, that's a case of indifference on his part and submission on her part. There are four types of marriage. Love and submit, indifference, where he's indifferent, and she submits. And then this was Gloria Steinem, uh, where the other example could have been where the, where the husband loves and the wife resists. Uh, that's possible. Uh, that can be. And then this was uh, I, an old show. This was uh, Dallas, J.R. And this was a case of indifference and resisting. He didn't love her, and she certainly did not uh, submit. But I think all couples have to be in one of these four, somewhere in one of these four. Love and submit, indifference and submission, love and resistance on the wife's part, or indifference on the part, husband's part, doesn't love, and she resists. And... Um, Let's look at 1 Corinthians 13. First Corinthians 13. Let's just go to verse 4. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. And I was told one time, if you want to see how you're doing with this chapter, put your name in, okay? So I'm gonna put my name in as I read it, and you try to put your name in, and when I say Tom, you put your name instead, okay? So just listen to how it reads. Tom is patient, Tom is kind. Tom is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Tom does not demand his own way. I'm failing miserably as I read this, by the way. Tom is not irritable, and Tom keeps no record of when he has been wronged. Tom is never glad about injustice, put your name in here, but rejoices whenever truth, whenever truth wins out. Tom, Tom never gives up, never loses faith. Tom is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. How's that a test, huh? 
to slide your name in there instead of that love. But that is what we're to be uh, in, in those roles. And I think there is no better way for us to accomplish those verses than by, uh, than by taking on our role. Listen, if, 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 I, if, if my role is to love my wife, then I do it patiently and kindly. I do it without jealousy, without being boastful about it or being proud. I do it without being rude. I love, with, I love and I don't demand my own way. I'm, I, I love and I'm not irritable as I love. And as I love, I don't keep any record of what she's done wrong. I just love. And I, I love is never glad about what's done wrong, but rejoices. And if I really love my wife, I'm, my love is not going to give up. My love is not going to lose faith in her. My love is always going to be hopeful. My love will endure through every circumstance we hit. But think about it from the wife, the wife's side. If the wife is submission, submissive, then her submissiveness is going to be patient and kind. Her submissiveness isn't going to be jealous or she's not going to boast about it. She's not going to be proud about her, her role. She, her submissiveness isn't going to demand her own way through that. Her submissiveness is not going to be irritable. Her submissiveness is not going to keep a record of when it's, it's been wrong, when her leadership has been wrong. Her submissiveness is never going to be glad about when he was wrong. Yeah, but it's going to re, but she's, she's going to rejoice whenever truth wins out, whenever it works. Submissiveness, uh, she'll never give up in being that way. She'll never lose faith. She will always be hopeful. And her submissiveness will endure through every circumstance. It's just beautiful how that works. So the way we're going to look at some articles that deal with uh, this issue on a, on, a, on a cultural basis and just see what culture says. So what Ephesians 5 says is that a man has a need to lead, to be uh, held in high esteem by his wife and respected. To lead, to be held in esteem and respect. Satan uh, takes a role in culture that instead the man is to be, uh, is to be bashed, put down, and um, not respected. And we're going to look at articles that point out how that is so true in culture today, that there's a cultural bias against men. Now, women need to be loved and, and feel secure, to feel cherished. Satan uh, tries to cause men to be indifferent toward their wives and to be abusive toward their wives. Uh, exactly opposite to what God says we need is what Satan tries to bring into the, the husband-wife relationship. And so, men, you earn the right to lead by loving your wife by serving your wife, by placing her desires above your own. Remember, Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life a ransom for many. So if you think your role as a husband is to go to the front and you ride the white stallion and she comes along behind on a little pinto uh, donkey or something, you know, that's not the role. Our role is to love our wives to put her needs, her desires ahead of our own. That's our role. Uh, and so uh, the, the question is, who goes first? A man says, I would love if she'd, if she'd respect me. And she says, I would respect him if he'd love me. But it's that chicken and the egg thing, which who goes first? And you know, Dan Van Vliet, came to this class one time and way many years ago. And when he was at the break, he said, you know, there is an answer to that. The husband, the husband goes first. It's our role to lead. And so it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter what your partner does. You're still supposed to do what God says you're supposed to do. Because there is no better plan. There is no plan B other than the plan A. And the plan A is for me to love my wife like Christ loved the church. That's my, that's my, that's, that's plan A. 
Plan A for the wife is to submit to the leadership of her husband. And if the one doesn't do the other, as difficult as it is, we're still to do what we're supposed to do. And here's the reason why. Listen, listen closely. Because there is no better tool that God has available in his toolbox to help your partner do what they should do than by you starting by doing what you should do. That's the best motivation that God can bring to your partner to do what they're supposed to do if you do what you're supposed to do first. Um, so let's, uh, this next one I think is in your book. I show page 17. Yeah. Let's look at page 17. We're getting into here what, what wives want from their husbands. Uh, the top article is a uh, noted author and pastor, John Hagee, uh, says this, but this was co-authored by um, his wife, Diana, and they say this, what, what women want from men. Number one, women want a man to love them completely, passionately, and romantically. Bible commands every husband, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. In short, be a passionate and devoted lover. Women are tired of men who offer little compassion or communication and act like a warden and treat everyone in the house like prisoners. Number two, women want, we're going to spend time on this the last week, women want non-sexual affection. When a wife says, come hold me, To her husband, he rubs his hands together, and as his testosterone meter explodes, he is ready for raw sex. She simply wants affection. In counseling sessions, I have asked men and women this question, how would you feel if you knew that you would never have sex again with your mate? Almost all women respond, listen, it's really no big deal if I never had sex again with my husband, but it would be a big deal if we never touched or kissed or romanced again. That's non-sexual affection. We'll talk about that more later. Number three, women want a man who can truly understand that women are divinely different and that they aren't going to change. In the movies, My Fair Lady, Professor Henry Higgins took on the unenviable task of trying to transform Eliza Doolittle, a commoner, into a sophisticated socialite in London. After weeks of extreme effort to correct her diction and the manner in which she walked and greeted people, he yelled in in exasperation, why can't a woman be more like a man? A woman cannot be like a man, and a man cannot be like a woman because each is divinely different from the other. And that fact will never change. God created man and woman that way, and the sooner you adjust and accept it, the happier you will be. That's a good statement. Number four, women want open communication. If you always have to give your opinion, you don't know how to communicate. If you have to always raise your voice to make your point, you don't know how to communicate. Communication is an exchange of feelings or information. Communication is giving your wife the freedom to disagree with you completely without you flying into a rage or pouting or sulking for weeks. Communication happens or you saying, I'm, this is off the grid, I'm the husband, you're to submit to me. Because again, submission can't be demanded. It's the obligation of the one under submission. So it's the same idea. You know, communication is giving your wife the freedom to disagree with you completely without you flying into a range or pouting or sulking for a week. Communication happens when you as a husband and wife can honestly tell each other who you are, what you think, how you feel, what you love, what you honor, what you esteem, what you hate, what you fear, desire, hope for, believe in, and are committed to without fear of a prolonged argument. Women want emotional intimacy. Emotional intimacy includes touching, caressing, hugging, kissing, and romancing. There are approximately 5 million touch receptors in the human body. More than 2 million are in the hands alone. Without the emotional intimacy of touch and personal communication, 
Sex with your wife is little more than domestic rape. It's a strong statement, but I think a lot of women would understand that. Women want spiritual intimacy. As a husband and wife pray together and for each other every day, the Bible says a three-fold cord is not easily broken. We'll be looking at that probably next week, how important praying together is. As a man and woman talking to God bound together in prayer is an unbreakable union. Do you know how hard it is to pray with someone when you're mad at that person? It's impossible. The last one, women want mutual submission. Love her as Christ loved the church. Give her non-sexual affection. Understand her differences without trying to change her. Give her open communication. Give her emotional and spiritual intimacy. Reverence her and provide for her. Love her as your own flesh. It's well written, isn't it? So again, we'll be talking about that. Uh, as we keep going. Again, Satan takes us 180 degrees off the mark. Uh, Let me read some articles that make this point. This first one is called, uh, this is actually called male bashing. This is actually written by a woman who uh, used to attend this church, and this is in a national magazine. She said, it's entitled Male Bashing. One icy winter morning, I drove to work burning with irritation toward my husband. As I hung up my coat, I fervently enumerated the details of his latest blunder to a captivated audience of my female co-workers. Testosterone, someone quipped testosterone as cheers of affirmation flooded the room. I strode to my room vindicated and understood. That afternoon, laughter spilled from the lunchroom as my female friends mischievously brainstormed self-improvement classes for men, such as Laundry 101, Sorting Silks and Socks, Hunting 302, The Art of Finding Things, and Navigation Techniques, a short course in asking directions. I joined them. As I joined them, a cartoon of a woman on her knees praying read, Thank you, Lord, for my two X chromosomes. Also made the rounds. I laughed so hard I cried. She goes on and says, Gender differences are fertile grounds for humor, and few of us would deny that a healthy dose of humor can ease exasperation. When your husband stands in the light of a gaping refrigerator yelling because he can't find the mustard that's right in front of his nose, it helps to be able to laugh. But our jokes deviate from tasteful wit into male bashing when they capitalize on failures and exploit weaknesses, pitting the genders against each other. She says, several years ago at a Christian women's retreat I attended, a discussion about the differences between men and women deteriorated into scathing stories about the inadequacies of men. Over bowls of popcorn and mugs of chocolate, we recklessly devalued most men we knew until a visitor commented by saying, wow, I was afraid you'd be into all that submission stuff. I am sure glad that you're more open-minded. You know, I often wonder if God is a woman. It makes sense if you really think about it. Men are such imbeciles, she said. The article goes on. If you think that this isn't taken to a higher level of thought and reason, here's an article from U.S. World, New- World Report. And it's entitled, Are Men Obsolete? It says, in America, men are a perennial and perhaps deepening problem. To be sure, men, like women, aren't all alike. They vary greatly in the degree of their aggressiveness, need to dominate, and so on. Still, as social scientists say, certain central tendencies characterize the sexes. And in recent weeks, both Business Week and CBS's 60 Minutes have featured stories on the mounting maladies of maleness. Quote, from kindergarten to grad school, Business Week reports, Girls now outperform boys in grades, admissions, student government, and extracurricular activities. Women are rapidly closing the MD-PhD gap and make up almost half the law students, the magazine says. Meanwhile, boys dominate in such dubious categories as remedial education, stimulant drug prescriptions, and suicide. He says at least for a few centuries, men have found productive niches in industrialized society, building roads, bridges, and communication networks, and founding a massive conglomerates while contributing to the science, arts, and humanities. 
But even during these periods of industrial growth, the great majority of the male species contributed far more muscle than mind to the Commonwealth. And now, in our globalized economy, many of those jobs in factories, mines, and repair and maintenance shops are fast disappearing, fleeing to foreign shores. All of which prompts the question, what shall we do with all these men? Sports and entertainment are possibilities. To make a living at them, it requires rare skill. Leisure is an option for those of independent means or with, with productive helpmates. But women tend to excel even in non-market domains, at least at such hapless pursuits as flower arranging, shopping, and of course, child rearing. There remains to be sure one large sector in which man retain unquestioned dominance, crime. In 2001, the FBI reports men arrested for violent crime outnumbered women roughly five to one, for murder, seven to one. Even in nonviolent categories, male prevail, prevailed 11 to one in illegal weapons possession, five to one in drunken driving, uh, and it goes on. The article, Are Men Obsolete? This is an article called Guys Just Want to Have Fun. Today, two recent reports revealed it. Girls who achieve and the boys who coast along on gut courses and hangovers. The trend has occasioned some predictions of a coming matriarchy in which high achieving women will rule a nation of slacker guys. We've all seen the movie, uh, An Endless Loop, culminating the most recent you, and me, you, Me, and Dupree, that little girl t-shirt slogan, girls rule, boys drool, is beginning to look less like a slur and more like an empirical observation. It ends by saying maybe we need to return to gender segregating higher education with the academic equivalent of Pinocchio's Pleasure Island for boys where they can hone their people skills at keg parties. But we need to have those high achieving girls more than ever. Someone after all is going to have to figure out how to make an economy run by super super um, slacker boys competitive again in a world filled with Chinese and Indian brainiacs. Here's an article from a U.S. News and World Report. Why should males exist? Why should males exist? It says you don't need to be a feminist to recognize that men are at the root of a lot of the world's problems. Compared with women, they are more likely to drive fast commit murder, desert their spouses, abuse children, develop autism or hemophilia, get into fights, become alcoholics, fail at school, find modern service seg segment employment uncongenial, get cancer and die young. Listen, 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 listen. This is serious. Now that Dolly, the clone sheep, has shown us that female mammals can produce directly from the cells of other females, the human race might well ask whether it's necessary to put up with these troubles anymore. Do you get it? Just create a super race of women. A super race of women. This uh, deals with this issue of male bashing. So there's a famous television news, uh, this was also US News World Report. A famous TV newswoman told this joke last month at a fundraising dinner for a woman's college. She said, a woman needed a brain transplant her doctor said two brains were available, a woman's brain for $500 and a man's brain for $5,000. Why the big price difference? The woman's brain had been used. About that same time, most in the audience laughed. Now this is the author, was, this author was at that banquet, a male. Most in the audience laughed, but one man stood up and booed. What's wrong? Asked a woman at his table. The man said, just substitute woman or Jew for man in that joke. Then tell me how it sounds. About the same time, American Greetings launched an ad campaign for Newsweek, Life, and other magazines. One ad featured a Thelma and Louise greeting card, which said, quote, men are always whining about how, how we're suffocating them. Punchline inside the card was, personally, I think if you can hear them whining, you're not pressing hard enough in the pillow. The newswoman, who is a friend, seemed shocked when I phoned and raised questions about her joke. Oh, the poor, sensitive, white male, she said. 
A spokesman for the greeting card company saw nothing wrong with a humorous card about a woman killing a man. He faxed a statement saying that the card had been pre-tested successfully, and besides, quote, we've heard no protests from customers who are buying and using this card, end of quote. But would American greeting print a card with sexes reversed so the humor came from a man joking about suffocating a woman? No, said the spokesperson, because 85 to 90 percent of cards are bought by women. The market, there is no market for a reverse card. He says, in truth, no man could get up at a fancy banquet and tell a joke about how stupid women are. And a greeting card joking about a, woman mur a woman's murder would be very unlikely, even if surveys showed that millions of males were eager to exchange such lighthearted, gender-killing greetings. The obvious is true. Listen, the obvious is true. A sturdy double standard has emerged in the gender wars. Uh, quote, there used to be a certain level of good-natured teasing about the sexes, says Christina Summers, author of Who Stole Feminism. She says, but now even the most innocent remark about women will get you into trouble, but there's no limit at all to what you can say about men. He goes on and says, until recently, for example, 3M Company put post-it notes with a printed message, men have only two faults, everything they say and everything they do. Anti-male greeting cards are increasingly graphic, with some of the most hostile coming from Hallmark shoebox division. Sample, one card says, men are such scum, excuse me, for a second there I was feeling generous. Detroit News columnist Kathy Young sees a rising tide of male bashing, including all men are a swear word, and men we love to hate calendars, and resentful it's always his fault, attitude pervading women's magazines. Commercial attempts to increase the amount of sexual antagonism in America are never a good idea. And if you keep attacking men as a group, they will eventually start acting as a group, something we should fervently avoid. But the worst impact, listen to this closely, but the worst impact of all of male bashing is on the young. Barbara Wilder Smith, teacher and researcher in Boston, was recently quoted in several magazines on how deeply anti-male attitudes have affected schools. When she made t-shirts for boys that said boys are good, all 10 of the female student teachers under her supervision objected to the message. One of the student teachers who was wearing a button saying, this is a student teacher, had a button on her, on her clothing that said, so many men, so little intelligence. The researcher said, quote, my son can't even wear the shirt out in his backyard. People see it and object strongly about the thing. It says boys are good. On the other hand, she says, nobody objects when girls wear shirts that say girls rule or when they taunt boys with a chant that goes, boys go to Jupiter to get more stupider, girls go to college to get more knowledge. Worse, she says, many adolescent boys object to the boys are good shirts too because they have come to accept the cultural message that something is seriously wrong with being a male. She ends by saying the time is ripe for people to think about the unspoken anti-maleism in our colleges and schools, she says, and the rest of popular culture as well. Um, now, one of the problems with this is um, Men, you know what? Let's take a break. This is a good place to take a break. We'll come back, do a little bit of this more, and then we'll go into the, into the uh, uh, reporting. And we have goodies up here and water in the back. The, the water? Oh, the goodies? Yeah. And then we'll be back at, uh, in 10 minutes, which would be 740. Thank you.
I'm okay, thank you. Yeah. I, so how are the Reese's peanut butter potato chip? They're dangerous because they're good. Are they? Do you like them? Whoa, look at that. All right. Maybe we'll go to week seven <laughs> with those. It, it tastes like a regular Reese's, but, but crunchy like a chip. Oh, yeah? Good taste, though? All right. Hey, I would, Sue just uh, reminded me we, don't, we do not have the class next Sunday night because of Easter, but she also re- made the point that we will not be here the, the, the Sunday after that either because Frank Turek is going to be here speaking Sunday morning and Sunday night. And um, so we're off for two weeks and then we'll be back just to let you know that. So let's, let's kind of talk about this you know, this whole thing about male bashing and um, how men respond to this, and this is on your, your notes, but men will, men either have pas- a passive flesh or macho flesh, and they will respond to this if, if they respond in, 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 a, in, a, in an ungodly way, either passively or macho. They'll either go silent or they'll attack with their, their mouth or their fist. And of course, that's all wrong. But it, 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 that, many times that's what happens. So men can destroy their wives with their tongues, especially if he has a speaking gift. Now, we, talk, we talked about speaking gifts before, don't we, that in a lot of couples... One has the ability to speak, and the other one, not so much. Do we talk about that? No? Oh, boy, that's an important one. So, in most couples, you know, we're, we're together because opposites attract. And so, gifts that one has, the other one does not, because you complement one another. Larry Burkett said, if, if, uh, if you both were exactly the same, you'd wake up one morning and realize that one of you is unnecessary. I always thought that's pretty good. I also heard someone say that if you've been married a while, you can, you can uh, calculate there are as many reasons why Satan put you together as God put you together. Because the differences that Satan would use to dis- try to destroy you are the same differences that God would try to use to shape you to, in, in to be more balanced. Do you get it? So Satan's, Satan's role would be to take those differences and tear you apart. God's purpose is to take those differences and draw you closer and balance you out more. Um, but as a part of that, a lot of time, either the husband or the wife has a speaking gift, which means they're, they're better at choosing words, they're a better communicator, uh, they're able to argue better and than the other party. And if you are in a marriage relationship and you have that speaking gift and your partner does not, but if you have that speaking gift, you've maybe never even thought about this because it's so easy for you to win all the arguments, all the debates, because you craft words better maybe and you get your, 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 your rebuttal in before they have the chance to finish their thought. But if you're on the other side you know how, how heavy-handed it can feel in an argument when they can just keep coming at you and you feel like a machine gun just hitting you over and over. And so that's why uh, the, the tongue, you know, James says, is the most deadly weapon that we, we, we hold, that we have possession of. And so he can destroy her with his tongue, um, you know the statement, sticks and stones may break my, your bones, but words will never harm you. You ever hear that? That's a lie out of the pit of hell. I remember the story of a couple where they, were, they had lost a baby one time. And years later, in a knockdown, drag out argument, he turned to her, put his finger in his, her face and said, and you couldn't even carry my baby. Sticks and stones may hurt your bones, but words will never harm you. 
Do you think she ever forgot that he said that? Maybe she forgave him. But boy, that, that goes someplace deep inside. Yeah. If you, if you have a speaking gift, you can destroy your wife. You can destroy your husband with your tongue. Be very careful. And that brings up the whole point of sarcasm. I just encourage you not to be sarcastic. You know what sarcasm comes from? It comes from the word scar. It means to tear the flesh. Scar means to tear the flesh. And in sarcasm, there's always a victim. There's always someone that's made fun of in sarcasm. And, and to test that, would Jesus ever have been sarcastic? Would he ever have done something, told a joke, or made light of someone that would have been at someone's expense? It would have made them feel less than. So it's easy to be sarcastic. If you're, if you're good at it, you enjoy it. You enjoy getting in a huddle and letting that stuff fly around. But I really encourage you, and I'm speaking to myself, you know, um, I need this class every year. So it's good for me to hear this too. But try not to be sarcastic. When those words come, just let that go. It's not a sin. It's not horrible. I just don't think it's really the best thing in a relationship. You know, years ago, I was on a, on a board with a, a national speaker and a very gifted man. And at the board meetings, it was a, it was a bunch of guys that were really good at sarcasm. And it would fly around the room. It would just fly. And uh, one time, I, we were going to go to Philadelphia for, uh, to, to, for, to a meeting. And we met at the, the Reading Turnpike Exchange. And I was in my car. I was gonna, he was going to get out of his car, get in my car. And we were going to go down to Philly together. So I'm in my car waiting for him at the turnpike. And as I'm there, I start looking at my car, and I thought, there's a, there's a CD. If he sees that, he's probably going to make a joke about that. I put it under the seat. And I had a book. I thought, he's probably critical of that book, and I'll put that book away. And, and I had, you know, my, you know, my radio station. He'll probably be critical make fun of that. So I turned the radio off. And I'm going through all this list of things because I don't want to be picked at. And then I thought... And then I thought, if somebody, if I was going to get in somebody's car, what would they be putting away because of me? Do you know what I mean? You know, I have in my prayer list about this church, I want to be a safe person. I want to be someone that people feel safe with. I really do. And that means, that means all of those areas where I would make jokes about or pick on or that, that, they would, that I would want you to know, and I'm, I'm not saying, I'm thinking I, could, I failed at this miserably, probably a lot, some of you today, but I want to be a safe person, and sarcasm doesn't make you a safe person. It doesn't. I just be careful about that, about the, about the tongue. So, and here's the other thing. If, if, you're, if you have a speaking gift, and you're good at it, and you get into an argument with somebody, you can use your words to cut them like a precision razor. And you, you can cut them apart with such precision that at the end, they're laying on the ground in pieces and they can't respond. Because you have so crafted your words that there's, there's no way to come back. And you win. And they feel disemboweled. So if you have that gift, uh, you don't know what it feels like on the other side to be getting that all the time. I'd be very careful about that. So in those kinds of situations, sometimes macho flesh, passive flesh, passive flesh is where a guy says, sure, honey, whatever. Yeah, of course, whatever you want. Yeah, that's no, all right. Yeah, because they're just not going to get into it. It's been there, done that. I'm not going to do it again. And so it's just all passive. It's the typical henpecked husband, the, 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 what you picture there, what he does. And sometimes men will retaliate by having an affair. 
Sometimes that'll happen. Sometimes, again, they just give up. Uh, doesn't acknowledge that there are problems, doesn't want to talk about it, just wants to go quiet. And, um, or he can do what is called the big daddy syndrome, where he's always out with his friends. He just always hangs out with his friends. So that's uh, where that can go, um, that process. Now we're going to break up into groups, and we're going to ask these two questions. What do I see as being my role as a husband? What do I see as being my role as a wife? And the second question is, what do I need from my husband? What do I need from my wife? So the men are going to answer that. The women are going to answer that. And then we'll come back next week, and we'll discuss those and uh, see what in three weeks. Thank you, Sue. We'll come back in three weeks. How I need her, my... Yay, Sue. So, men, we're going to go upstairs. If you're not from this church, we go out, out into the vestibule, up the stairs, and there's a library up there, and we'll, we'll meet up there. We have a, a board uh, panel like this, and the women are going to stay here, okay? So we'll gather up there as soon as we can get up.